Coming up today on TechNado, we've got a train wreck of an episode because Peter Van Reisnum is out this week at the RSA conference. We're going to have Daniel, uh, Lowry, and Justin Dennison all standing in here trying to cover up PVR's role for us. It's going to be a blast. We've got news articles on all sorts of activity. We've got Microsoft updates. We've got cryptocurrency being stolen. All the things we expect in a regular episode. And a very special interview with the CEO of Stardog. Be sure to tune in for that starting now. All right, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, and welcome back to TechNado. I'm Don Pizzette, standing in as host because, well, Mr. Peter Van Reisdom is out at RSA right now. So if you're out there, look for him. He's the really pale guy uh, <laughs> that's stumbling around trying to figure out what everything means. Uh, in the meantime, I brought in some of my esteemed colleagues, Mr. Justin and Mr. Daniel. Thank you for joining me. Thanks for having it's us. Uh, luckily, fun. luckily, you had two other really pale guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> just hanging around, and uh, and it shows how uh, how I'm a bad selector of friends. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> these are these are my esteemed colleagues. Uh, yeah. This is what I've got to work with. That was but, not the adjective that I was <laughs> anticipating <laughs> when you were talking. Esteemed colleagues <laughs> slash homeless people. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, just look at him. Yeah. Just look at him. I mean, the white bounces off. He's reflective. <laughs> well, we are going to have a good time today. We have a great interview you lined up for later on in this episode uh, with a company that handles or works in big data and graph and all that, which is why Justin is here, because he understands that stuff, and I do not. And Daniel is here, who's normally our resident security guy, but most of you know I've been on a bit of a tirade lately trying not to overwhelm the <laughs> podcast with security articles. But so it's the fun stuff. So. It, it is sometimes. It's almost like low-hanging fruit. It's it too really easy. Is. They, just, they just give it to you, right? Uh, what company got breached this week? And there you go. Oh, I'll look at my list. <laughs> but we do have a lineup of great, exciting things that are going on in the tech industry this week. So we're going to go through and take a look at them. Let's get started right here with an article on Bloomberg Business Week. And this was a fun one because I could totally relate to it. The headline is, America's cities are running on software from the 80s. The 80s, the 1980s, for those of you who may have been born in the 1980s and or afterwards, uh, was 30 years ago. That's a long time yeah. to have software deployed uh, that has not, not been <laughs> updated. And, what are you trying to say, Don? And so, I mean, uh, Daniel, so you, you're the, the security expert yeah. here. So software like this, do, do we need to worry about it? What do we care? I, I would uh, So here's the thing. Yes, you do need to worry about it. That is definite yes. And uh, did I say yes? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, there's a little remember. bit of that. Uh, Usually these are air gap systems. Usually these are things that you really can't get your hands on. The problem with these things typically lies in the fact that you can't turn it off or people don't have water, or, you know, <laughs> or power or, you know, the modern accoutrements of, you know, first world society. So if you shut them off, they don't know if they'll turn back on or if it'll work at all. So they're kind of in this limbo state to where, what do we do? And they're scrambling to figure out a solution, but they don't seem to really have a good one yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, in the article, it gave a couple of examples, one of which was uh, in San Francisco. They had a, a, a tax assessor or property assessor, I don't remember which, uh, that was still running an AS400 that used COBOL development. Now, AS400s, I, They're I still thought this running. was a little odd. They, they are still running. You can still get mm -hmm. support on an AS400 from IBM. But according to the article, theirs has not seen an update since 2009. Uh, I've actually helped a number of companies move away from AS400s, and I know it is incredibly expensive to do anything. Uh, and, and that's really where a lot of these companies get hung up is it's not like they want to be running software from right. the 80s. But when the vendor tells you, oh, yeah, it's $22 million and we can move you over to this version that runs on Linux instead. Yeah, once they pick themselves up off the floor, they go, <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if it's the federal government, they're like, oh, well, we'll give you $44 million. Yeah. But <laughs> if it's state and local, on the other hand, yeah, it's a little yeah, different. Not so, uh, so swimming in the dough. There, I think it's right? funny in this article, there's actually like a subheading called Chicken Wire and Duct Tape. Are running. I just imagine walking into a server closet and there's like a small chicken <laughs> and like just taped Wait. over and be like, all right, so Bobby told us not to turn this off. Listen, Jeff Healy better watch out. <laughs> <laughs> You know, uh, Roadhouse. Oddly yeah. enough, around the office, Roadhouse has been coming up quite a yeah. lot. Uh, it's yeah. uh, an unusual one. But uh, they do have a bit of a wall of shame down towards the bottom of the article. Like uh, the Baltimore Police Department uh, has a system for tracking crime reports. It's over 20 years old. To upgrade it, 
four million dollars and you know that's money they i'm sure would rather spend on things like body cameras and armor right. and all that but uh upgrading a computer system isn't necessarily where they want to go on that uh the office of emergency services in broom county new york uh they're running radio systems from the 1970s cost to upgrade 23 million dollars so i totally get it why, <laughs> why these people aren't upgrading but one thing that i've run into more than once is where there's these legacy systems that they do retrofit one way or another to connect them to the network, and they are in generally not secure. Uh, I had a chance to interview Grim Security a few years ago, and they were talking about one one place they went that had put these IP, IP boards in so they could do their industrial control stuff, their ICS. Mm -hmm. And when they started doing a ping sweep to scan the network, uh, it burned out these boards oh, because the no. boards weren't designed to handle traffic at the normal levels. Like, you know, 100 megabit <laughs> and gigabit networks can push a lot of data. Oh, and these man. things were... You know, back in the, the token ring days, four megabit was blazing. Yeah. So they just weren't able to handle it. And it was physically burning out boards. So that, that's bad news. Yeah, that, that's that's not a good thing. I did see uh, last year I was at RSA, you know, the, Adam's there today. And so is Peter. Um, and they were talking about systems that are, I can't update this. What do I do? So they created all sorts of really cool compensating controls that you can put in line, basically NAC type systems that will check traffic, make sure that it's bound and valid for that system and then just keeping all other types of traffic out. So they wouldn't have got that ping. Yeah. Well, I mean, that that might have got through because they probably would have programmed that in. But off the shelf, it was said, nope, you're not part of the system. Don't do that. So that's what they're doing to try to, you know, put Band-Aids on these things. Yes. Yeah is have these uh, third-party systems come in and, and control them. We had a, uh, I, I used to work for a bank, and uh, and at that bank we had this one server. It was a special system that connected, connected to the Fed of all places, um, <laughs> but it was a legacy system, and we could not trust the security on it, but we were required to run it. Uh, and so I, you know, I, I was the network manager, so what I suggested was we'd put a dedicated firewall, a physical firewall, actually attached directly to that server. So, you know, the network card from that server ran right to the firewall. So it was everybody, even internal stuff was filtered. You have to take extra steps to yeah. protect these things. So definitely a, a big a big risk. And, and this just goes on and on in Philadelphia it's, and New Jersey. I think it really sums up in this, uh, this one little blurb where they're talking about San Francisco. We're trying to address problems that cannot be solved by the app store. There's an app. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. There's an app that's create, that has been created that lets people report Poop on the streets in San Francisco. Because that's like a real thing. There. It's called yeah. Snap Crap. We, uh, we talked yeah. about that one. And, yeah. and they that said designing funny. something to help the city pay for it, the, the cleanup. Yeah. Uh, different story. That, that, that's, <laughs> the issue. that's the issue. So you can report it, yeah. you just can't address it we in a timely manner. Find the poop. We just can't do anything about it. Yeah. Um, Soil with poop. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go ahead and move on to our next uh, <laughs> amazing topic. Uh, Firefox released an update. Uh, I did a webinar a few months ago on surfing the dark web. I know a lot of our viewers had a chance to watch that. And one thing I highlighted in that webinar was how if you resized the Tor browser window, that many governments had found how they could track who you were in your browsing history based on the dimensions of your window. They, they could use that as one identifying factor. Mm -hmm. So Firefox is rolling out a new feature, an anti-fingerprinting technique, where when you go to a website, it will fake the dimensions of the page, regardless of what your browser's actually at. So it'll load at one size and then stretch after, uh, something like after half a second. It'll then stretch to fill your actual dimensions, thus defeating the fingerprinting size of your window. So pretty pretty neat one to come down the line. I love how I like, we come up with these ways in which to stay anonymous online, which is an important thing. I mean, we have whole like culture that's geared toward being anonymous online. I just want to, I just want to surf the web. I just want to see some things. I don't want everybody tracking me and whatever it is I do. And then the government comes up. Well, we want to track you because we have to be able to find you because there's bad people out there. Yeah, I get that. Then we're gonna fix it. It's, it's just this cat and mouse game that never ends. Uh, I'll be honest. I hadn't even heard about this, and this no. is one of the things where. I've become increasingly more paranoid the longer I've worked here. And this is when I'm like, hold up but a second, why, Justin. I need to change all of my browser sizes immediately. Yeah, yeah. Well, so let, let me tell you, like a, a normal user really wouldn't have to worry about this at all. But if you've installed Tor in the last year, and I don't have it on my laptop, so I'm trying to install it real quick. But if you installed Tor in the last year, when you launch the Tor browser, it actually gives you a warning about it when you try and resize your window. I think it actually warns you before it. So if, if you've used the Tor browser, you should have seen that message. Although, if you're trained like most of us, you just close up yeah. cookies. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Click. So uh, anyhow, I'll try and fire it up. But yeah, that, that's been around for a little while. Uh, it, it came out that 
uh, somebody somebody got caught that way. I mean, somebody bad, you know, yeah. like a Silk Road person got caught that way. And then once once they knew about it, it was something they warned everybody about, like, hey, don't don't resize your Tor browser window because they can find you. Yeah, <laughs> and they'll find you. That's so and they awfully will. specific yeah. and terrifying. Yeah, absolutely yeah. terrifying. Liam Neeson right. shows up. Yeah, <laughs> I'm almost there. Come on, Tor browser. You can do it, Don. I know. I, I thought I could install it fast while we were talking. Now, <laughs> now I'm just stalling. Uh, but anyhow, there you go. almost That's connected. Going. So uh, when we fire up the Tor browser, it warns you, Firefox is pushing out an update. Firefox, uh, most of you probably do know, is the browser that the Tor browser is based off of. So Tor is really just a, f- or the Tor browser is a fork of Firefox designed to run right on the Tor network. Uh, and so there, I just installed it. And if I full screen it, there we go. <laughs> so I've installed Tor browser here on my laptop. And when I full screen it immediately, a little message pops up and it says, maximizing the Tor browser can allow websites to determine your monitor size, which can be used to track you. So that's been there for like a year now. And okay. so in a, in the newer versions of Firefox, that method of tracking is being taken away. Yeah. All right. So uh, the more you know, right? Good for that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's move on to a fun one. Microsoft has been having a bad run of it with Windows updates. Ars Technica had an article on anti-cheat software causing big problems for Windows 10 previews. Uh, now, I know both of you guys, uh, Justin, you're a Linux guy. Daniel, you're, you're a Linux, Linux guy. Yeah. Do, do either of you even run Windows? No. No, not if I can help it. Yeah. Oh, the dude, only I time I run Windows. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, you hey, know, I'm we, saving you a license, buddy. That's true. That <laughs> is true. We're out in the, they're like, oh, it doesn't work. I'm like, yeah, it doesn't. And I'm glad I'm not part of it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, uh, you know, Microsoft, they have uh, these the insider program that anybody can join, and you get updates ahead of time. And there's different levels of that insider program. There's the fast ring where, I mean, you're on the cutting edge. You get all sorts of stuff that is sometimes is broken. Uh, but there's also the slow ring. And the slow ring, it only has updates that have been proven stable and will eventually become that next release. And the idea is that enterprises, large companies, can get on that slow ring and test all of their software before an update comes out and make sure they're ready for it. It's a great idea. Well, the slow ring has not seen an update in over six months. And that's more than slow. And so people have been asking about it and saying, what's going on here? And Microsoft has finally uh, announced what's going on. So apparently there's some anti-cheat software that is used in several video games as part of their... um, uh, You know, like uh, Fortnite and stuff. Yeah, so you don't cheat while you're online? Yeah, Yeah, I I guess... I'm not uh, up in this area, so I'm going to use terminology that'll yeah. make me sound old. But uh, they have auto aimers, so uh, in a first-person shooter, me? like it will aim for you and stuff. And and at I, that point, what's the purpose of playing the game? Well, esports, you make millions of internet dollars. <laughs> oh, whatever. <laughs> you just said esports. You, you, yeah, <laughs> just, you just put me right into a world I don't want to exist in. <laughs> I thought you were going to say it's like macroing, like back in the, the old school like MMORPGs, but you're like auto aimers. I'm like, yeah. so I can go get a Mountain Dew, Code Red, yeah, 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 while I'm also winning. Yeah. So apparently, yeah. one of these is uh, is causing problems with the updates, and so if they apply the update, it causes a green screen of death. Which um, you get a green screen when you're in the Insider program versus the blue screen that you normally get. Uh, so anyhow, it's green. <laughs> it's very exciting. <laughs> so uh, so it's causing problems. So they haven't been able to push the updates to it. So the slow ring is actually so far behind that the slow ring is basically equal to a normal install at this point. So that program has been totally derailed by anti-cheat software that businesses don't run. And that's where the real problem is. Home users might care about this. Video gamers would care about it, but businesses don't. And so the slow ring is totally off the rails. And so Microsoft is having to deal with that and trying to figure out what's going on. But right now, if you go into the slow ring, it is, let's see, they say it in the article here somewhere. It's still on like the 18 H2 update or, or, you know, whatever the October Mm. update was last year. If they would quit changing the name of updates every month, that would help me with covering these articles. But, uh, but anyhow, so if you're wondering why your slow ring has not been updating, there it is. Anti-cheat software. Do they they have patch someday? Is that what they call it now? Oh yeah, patch someday. (laughs) (laughs) Not Tuesday. It it was funny because, you know, you said enterprises, but there's this little tweet, I'm assuming it's someone from, from Microsoft who was like, yeah, we're holding off because of this. And many of you are playing these games. Don, I, I, are we allowed to play Fortnite at work? Absolutely. <laughs> We're going to do a new uh, Fortnite training program. That's right. Uh, I have a whole uh, tech skill series on here's Fortnite. Here's how you use an auto-aimer. Yeah. And then we just turn the camera on and leave. Have either of you played Fortnite? No. Now? It is 
dumb. I do not understand. <laughs> <laughs> my, my son, I mean, my, my older son, he plays it, and, and, I, and he hates it, yeah. but he still plays it because his friends do. And I say, why, why are you playing this game you hate? My friends play it. And I bet if I went to his friends, they'd say the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> it's like this Let's weird... Stop the like, circle here, boys. It's like the, the weird social pressure where you yeah. go, I hate it, but I, I can't stop. I'll yeah. be ostracized. Yeah. That's right. Can, can I buy some more virtual me. bucks? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, we'll be able to sit here at lunch. I know it has a weird co- commoditization, like... Uh, they're like, oh, you need to buy this upgrade. Yeah. Look at this. There's a new shirt. You got to have a cat head. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's like three different um, like things you can do, right? You can do like open world building, like first person shooter and stuff. You like, seem to know a lot about this. So, <laughs> yeah. And the reason being is people were like, oh, you know, my, my kid's addicted. I'm like, what is so? So I went and read it. I was like, this sounds, yeah. this sounds kind of dumb. Yeah. I don't does your computer not have a power button? Because all of mine do. Yeah. Is that a special feature? Yeah. There's actually a really large power button. It's in a gray box with a, a door. You open it up. The top one, if you're in a newer home, you just flick it. All the power goes out. I got Wi-Fi better. and everything. It, it has these 44 Magnum bullets inside of it. <laughs> that computer will stop working. <laughs> all right. Well, sticking with Microsoft, let's jump over to ZDNet. Uh, Microsoft starts rolling out ability to turn photos of table data into Excel spreadsheets. This is really cool. Uh, you know, they have been pushing out this Office Lens product? Uh, have either of oh, you used yeah, Office yeah. Lens? I haven't used it. But uh, actually, I, heard. I I was surprised. Uh, so how I've good taken, it was, right? Uh, I've taken pictures of whiteboard, mm-hmm. and I'm like, wow, that legit looks like I opened up a tablet and like wrote on it. Yeah. I, I've used it to scan because my scanner at home like jacked up and I needed to scan. So I was like, I lost your... Wow, that works really well. Mm. Yeah, and so it, you know, it'll do OCR. You, it, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, uh, Office Lens, it's free in the App Store. Right. I think it's free, or is it tied to uh, Office 365? Uh, I it's on my phone, and I'm not. All right. I haven't tied it to. I'm going to label it as free-ish. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you can download it, and basically it allows you to take a picture of a document. It OCR scans it and turns it into an editable document that you're able to store in your cloud data or you know wherever you want to put it, uh, and you can use it. Well, they have uh, come up with a, a similar product which allows you to take a picture of a table. And when it takes the picture, it actually turns it into a real table that you can fire up in Excel and then edit and work with and all that. So really awesome. Uh, you know, you can use it when you're at the Vegas sports book and you <laughs> want to take a picture and the table's right in there yes. and you can plan your life savings. Uh, yeah, and, and you have that machine learning algorithm. You just throw <laughs> that in. Uh, actually, this this would be really handy. There's time. Justin's over here scheming about how he can make money in Vegas <laughs> yeah. now. Yeah. Oh, well, no, I know I'm not going to make money in Vegas. Um, there were times where like PDF documents, I needed to grab information, at, you know, and like in grad school sure. and stuff. I'm like, I got to type all this in. I tried to run it through OCR software and it was like, ah, stuff. <laughs> it just kind of <laughs> melded it together. This would have came. Yeah. Wow. That, that saved me two days. Yeah. Right. So this is actually pretty cool to me. Yeah, and uh, even if you don't have Office Lens, apparently you're able to just take an image file, and in Excel you can choose to import data from an image, and it'll import just like you know from a CSV or whatever. So really cool feature. Neat to see. Uh, you know, I, this is probably one of those like Microsoft Labs products that some intern came in with and decided it would be cool, and darn it, they were right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so here it is. All right, let's jump on to the next one. Now, this is one that I know you use, Daniel. Wireshark. Did you see Wireshark version 3 I heard released? It, it dropped finally, right? And, yeah, um, it's been a long time. It has been a hot minute since they've come out with some some really good update for that thing. But I, look, I haven't read the article, though. Uh, anything interesting? I mean, it's already a great product. How could they make it better? <laughs> but wait. Uh, so the big deal here was something that I was excited about. Uh, many of you, uh, if you've ever installed Wireshark, you know that it also installs, if you're on Windows, yeah. it installs the Win PCAP uh, packet capture driver. And if you've been watching, Win PCAP is not updated in a while. Apparently it is now unsupported. So it's not receiving updates. Now, to understand the risk you're taking there, if you're installing a packet capture driver, it sits in between your your operating system and the network card driver and intercepts every single bit of traffic. That's not exactly something you want to be non-supported and out of date and so on, right? It's a huge uh, vulnerability. So they have actually switched and are abandoning Win PCAP, although the support's still there, so it's backwards compatible, uh, and moving over to NPCAP, which is a, a newer product that is currently supported and has a a wide developer base attached to it. So that's the big deal is it's a new capture driver, which meant they had to do a lot of work on their end to be able to to integrate and support with that. But after that, uh, you know, that's a moved over. Is is it Riverbed or somebody that owns the WinPCAP driver now? I thought Riverbed had Wireshark. 
It, uh, is that what it, is that who it is? Well, is that I, they? Uh, I might have it mixed up. Because I remember I was trying to get a hold of either the WinPCAP or NPCAP because it wasn't installed on a Windows system because uh, I was trying to use Kane and Able. Oh, and NPCAP was, is a part of the wasn't allowing group, me so, to, yeah, it's not that yeah, one. Yeah, yeah, it must be uh, WinPCAP then. So I didn't realize when you set out a date, yeah, you no, went it was like straight up. Uh, uh, yeah, I couldn't so, even download it from their page. Did you pull up the what, when was last? So like yeah. further down in that article, it actually gives you a, oh, like I a comparison read. between an NPCAP and <laughs> yeah. WinPCAP. Um, yeah, the latest latest release for WinPCAP was 2013. 2013, nice. <laughs> but the underlying libpcap, which is like the underlying C drivers, maybe that or the, the yeah. C library, mm-hmm. 2008. Nice. That, Vintage. A, yeah. yeah. I'm like, ah, you got to save that. It's just getting better with time. <laughs> yeah. It's uh, like a fine wine. They did change the licensing of also. security. <laughs> uh, so that's, I think that's also an important note. It was mm. BSD style. Now, MPCAP has free for personal use, right. which I'm guessing, based on that phrasing, is more restrictive. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Free for personal use. Are you using it personally? <laughs> no? Oh, well, that's different, right? So. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, I personally used it in my business. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I sure did. Me. It was me. Exactly. Yeah, I'll, I'll the good problem. old licenses. <laughs> well, anyhow, definitely uh, uh, a nice thing to see there. Uh, there are some security features that are available inside of MPCAP that make it a little more robust, uh, and it's able to capture uh, you know, capture data just mm-hmm. like before. Uh, I did think it was interesting that it's able to capture loopback data, which we were not able to do in Wireshark previously. It didn't didn't work properly, at least yeah. not through WinPCAP. So, uh, so nice to be able to see that. Uh, keep in mind, if you are running Mac OS or Linux, they don't use WinPCAP, yeah. so you don't really care, so right? Eat it. <laughs> so, That's right. Yeah, it, it leverages uh, <laughs> TCP dump and some of the other yeah. things that are in the background on, on the Unix-based operating systems. But for Windows users, definitely an important thing. All right, uh, let's see. Let's jump to our next one. We are going a little Microsoft heavy today, but uh, Microsoft, uh, this is this is big, big news. Uh, you know, wow, uh, this is big news. <laughs> Microsoft has announced they are open sourcing the Windows calculator. I can die a happy man now, Dan. <laughs> you know, it's uh, every year I've looked at that product and said, oh, I could do so much more free. if I just didn't have to write this calculator app that is the project of almost every second year college development <laughs> yeah. student. Yep. Yep, it, it is. I, I mean, I write one every Thursday just to, just to a... cake me back. It's nostalgia, really. <laughs> yeah. it, it is. It is. Uh, it takes is, you back, doesn't it? It does. Yeah. I mean, it has commits at the time of this recording within three hours. So, I mean, people are still like, what are they doing to yeah, it? What are they doing? It, it just does math. Uh, <laughs> we... What's funny is the commit message says spelling. Like, was something the spelled spelling wrong? of the calculator? Like three was spelled wrong. Oh, <laughs> we put a Q in it. Oh, that's a, Man, Billy's coding again. Uh, yeah, yeah, he's, yeah. he's been hitting a... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I got to see. I'm pulling up the Git uh, uh, log right now. And uh, and you're right. I mean, there are some three hours ago right there. Uh, it HTTPS link? looks like in a document or uh, in, like, code comments mm. Okay, uh, is where the spelling... Because I was like, what are huh. you talking about? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it looks like it's all comments, the ones I mean, I'm looking at. The calculator, it got reskinned uh, in Windows 7 or Windows. Oh, I don't remember. You, yeah. You're asking yeah. the wrong people. Yeah, you yeah, already yeah, really are. Anyhow, it got Windows. reskinned. It, had, it has a new skin. <laughs> you think that it has it a has really calculator? Changed. Well, yeah, you know, they got to do the ribbon on everything these days or make it touch capable so they reskinned it. Can you, can you program a basic eight. in it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. Um, <laughs> what a piece of crap. <laughs> I, I don't use the calculator as much as I used to anyway, because, I mean, you can do math inside of Google searches yeah. or oh, yeah. whatever. So, As a matter of fact, if you type a math expression in a Google search, you it get a calculator. Yeah. Hmm. So, yeah, if you do, like, what is 3 plus 2? Yeah. It'll bring up a little calculator. Of course, then you're sharing all your math with Google. Yeah. Uh, so. Well, they already did knew my know screen size. Did you know 3 plus 3 is Q? <laughs> <laughs> they already knew my screen size, so it didn't That's matter. That's true. Uh, That's so, true. yeah. So don't perform illegal math in yeah. yeah. web browser. Yeah. That's a lesson there. <laughs> illegal math. <laughs> All right, Nobody let's move away. Yeah, divide by zero. Yeah. Let's uh, <laughs> move on to just check uh, to show up. <laughs> non-Microsoft news. <laughs> and Amazon. Amazon has officially killed off the Dash button. Thanks to Microsoft. <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, so the Dash button, some of you may or may not remember, was a nice little Wi-Fi gadget that you could program and tie it to a, an Amazon product. A lot of people thought it was an April Fool's joke, but it was a real thing uh, where Mike you push some. a button. Huh? I think Mike bought a bunch of them. I, I had one. Did you? Kitty litter. Yeah. Oh, nice. yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Every time I'd run low on kitty litter, you hit that button and then order it. Oh, I just let my cats hit it. They're like, yeah, we need more. <laughs> yeah. We need, we need to push more the kitty He's like, this yeah. stinks. Actually, I thought it was an April Fool's joke because I remember seeing the initial commercial and going, nah, nah, nah. Well, who would buy that? I mean, then 
Well, there you go. Yeah. Like we're Mike four Roderick. years later. Yeah. <laughs> and well, Tom Pizzette. you know, um, I, I stopped using it because you can just tell your, your Alexa to, to order. I saw him, I'm ruining everybody home, and you just say, Alexa, order 5,000 boxes of kitty litter. <laughs> 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 and it does it. Well, hold on, man, your Alexa. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, cancel, cancel. Yeah. So, uh, so anyhow, so it, it does it, and that, that, that's what Amazon even said, is, hey, more people are using the Echo devices. Uh, more people are doing scheduled, uh, what is it called, the Subscribe and save. Yeah, yeah. Subscribe so and save. So people are doing that, uh, and you know the novelty of the button kind of wore away. Uh, but there is a, a hacker community built around these buttons because you can program them to do anything. So now you can have a Wi-Fi button that does all sorts of crazy stuff. Yeah. So I don't know. Have you messed with those, Justin? You're, uh, you're kind I, of our IoT guy. Yeah, I haven't. I haven't messed with those. I, I'll be honest with you. I don't even particularly like my Echo. Like, I, it just randomly comes on and goes, what did you say? I was like, I didn't say Shut anything. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not buy 5,000 <laughs> things yeah. of kitty litter. Yeah. Um, so I, I haven't really messed a great deal with those other than a few Alexa skills. But I don't, I don't know. That's What's his name? Um, Ed Scotus, like, programmed his whole entire office around the Echo hmm. and, and Alexa and being able to, like, you walk in the door and realizes, that, oh, that's Don's Mac address to his phone. And it's like, hello, Don, and does all these things. And he was talking about it at some talk and, I was at. And that's how Skynet started. Yeah, basically, that's, exactly. that's how Skynet started. He's like, I wrote the whole thing in Bash. Like, <laughs> I have an Echo in, in every room in my house. Uh, so I've, I've fully compromised all of my privacy to, to Amazon. Uh, but, you know, they're, they're incredibly useful. And, yeah. you know, I, I will say on, on the security front, uh, the Dash buttons are going to keep working. But if you decide to toss yours, if you're done with it, there is a procedure for erasing and resetting that button, and you need to do it because that button is linked to your account with no confirmation. If somebody gets a hold of the button, one, they could order a hell of a lot of kitty litter. Yeah. <laughs> or two, they could potentially compromise the device and extract a, a key that's valid, at least for a short period of time, to be able to reach out and touch your account. So definitely make sure you erase those before you toss them. All right, let's jump over to more hardware news. This one's uh, actually something most of us probably care about, which is USB 4 is starting to materialize, coming down the pipe. Uh, we talked about USB 3.2 last week, so this is how fast we're advancing <laughs> these days. Uh, USB 4 is actually gathering together the Thunderbolt standards with USB 3.2 to create an all-new super-fast connection. I believe it is 40 gigabit now, which this article from Engadget is apparently not saying, or I'm, oh, no, I'm just moving too fast. Yeah. So uh, the folks at Engadget reported on this that, uh, you know, with 3.2, you can get up to 20 gigs. With Thunderbolt, you can go higher. Wrapping it together to form USB 4, you get one, better compatibility, and two, 40 gigabit speeds across a USB 4.0 cable. Now, Don, correct me if I'm wrong. That's fast. Uh, that is fast for now. <laughs> yeah, for now. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll see, you know, a year from now, we'll be like, oh, crap, 40 gigs. Gotta wait for this USB 4. Why do you have this crap stuff? <laughs> <laughs> my DVD <laughs> burner's not working. Right. <laughs> I forgot my token ring cable. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I want to drop your tokens, Don. <laughs> uh, all right. So uh, anyhow, uh, USB 3 has obviously been, I mean, that, that's... That's everywhere. Any any computer you buy today is going to have USB 3. I don't know, and the article doesn't speculate as to when USB 4 will become standardized like that, but it'll likely be 2020. It is coming down the line, though, so it's always nice to have faster connections. I've gotten frustrated by, you know, sometimes you have Thunderbolt, sometimes you don't. So USB-C doesn't really communicate to you what the hell that port can do. <laughs> so it is nice to see it all get wrapped together into the standard. We'll see where that goes. Uh, they will be releasing detailed specs in mid-2019, so I think 2020 is a good estimate on this one. All right, let's see. Uh, popular science. Now we're going uh, exploratory. This one does tie back to tech, trust me. Uh, a 10 million pound undersea cable just set an internet speed record. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, there are cables running along the ocean, uh, not on the bottom, they usually don't sink all the way. They kind of float somewhere in the middle, uh, running in between the continents. And not one or two, there's like a hundred of these cables, and they move tons and tons of data. One of them set a new speed record this week. Uh, and they show a picture. Here's a cable. <laughs> all right, so <laughs> it's nothing really It to seems see there. deceptive, the picture. So this particular <laughs> cable is called, uh, I believe it's actually pronounced Maria, but it might be oh. Maria. Uh, and it uh, is pushing quite a bit of data across 4,100 miles. And somewhere in here, they actually tell us the speed that they hit, which was really impressive. So uh, here it is, 20, well, 
So they said they hit 20 terabytes per second. They actually hit a higher speed, but that was what they said they could guarantee uh, at that level. So 20 terabits per second. That's pretty darn fast. Don, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's fast. <laughs> now, <laughs> that's USB 5 fast. Yeah, <laughs> it's USB 5 fast. We could be picky and say that it's no faster yeah. than 10 terabits because it's all moving at the same speed. It's simply higher bandwidth, like more bandwidth right? Yeah. So it moves more data simultaneously. It doesn't actually move any Be faster. faster. <laughs> huh, that's true. <laughs> but that's, but that's being picky. Uh, anyhow, it is super mega fast. It's pretty awesome. Uh, but now this diagram was the one that I really wanted to show of all the different oceanic cables that are out there. A lot of people are under the impression that when you go intercontinental on the internet, you're going across satellites. But that is rarely the case because the latency to a satellite is so incredibly high. It's like two seconds up and two seconds down. That is way too long. Oceanic cables are where it's at. Uh, and they run these. They, you know, they have a big boat that pulls them along. Which actually, they have a picture of that, too. Uh, and that drops the cables. The cables sink not to the bottom, though, because, like, the abyss is really, really down there. Uh, and so it kind of floats in the middle. And they have enough give in them so that if, like, a whale swims into them, they just kind of move out of the way. Okay. Uh, it's A lot of thought goes into these things. What about the aliens under the ocean? Oh, the yeah, yeah, the abyss. They might be like, what are you doing? Stop I didn't even think about that. stuff on our head. All of a sudden. Ten million uh, pounds. Uh, what was her name? Oh, the, the actress. It, uh, Mary Elizabeth Matthew Antonio. Yeah, all of a yeah. sudden she comes along, she got to fix the cable. And <laughs> <Yeah. there's... laughs> She's getting resuscitated in the <laughs> bottom of some horrible canyon. Yeah. <laughs> so am I going to get this speed to my house or in my neighborhood you soon? wish. Yeah, I, I do wish. If you get on a boat. <laughs> I can get a man can <laughs> dream, just, Kenny. Just, just jack into it on the side. <laughs> what are you doing? Movies. Got to get these movies real good. I just don't even need to download them. I just want to watch them. <laughs> yeah. You know, there were a lot of stories about how in World War II, there were underseas communication take, uh, cables, and, or even during the Cold War, and the U.S. tapped in. We, we had submarines that would go and tap into the Russian cables to listen in on communiques. I, I'm sure they did the same to us. So people are tapping into these things. Mm -hmm. But the new ones are fiber optic. So it is light, which is really hard to tap into. Uh, although if you can do it, uh, it's very, very hard to detect if you're lifting a little bit of a light signal out of there. Uh, but it is a, a real possibility. Mm -hmm. So. Very cool that this technology is out there, and uh, just neat to see these I, new speakers. I was surprised the cable was no bigger. What it looks like maybe than a human leg or an arm. You know what they say in here somewhere? It's only got like 12 strands of fiber in it. Really? Um, yeah. You, That's you'd think crazy. Load yeah. it up with as much as they could, but uh, apparently the cables are so incredibly heavy. Gotcha. They have to keep it at a minimum. Otherwise, they wouldn't be able to put it on a boat and start yeah, laying it. So, yeah. there's yeah, there's a lot behind it. They need one of those shipping ship shipping ships. <laughs> if you're ever bored, <laughs> yeah. Google shipping. shipping ship, shipping, shipping ships. Yes. Uh, look that up. It's it, a real thing. It's, it's so it's cool. Trippy. Yeah. It's trippy. It's so trippy. You got, oh. And then, the, of course, the whole language thing. Yeah. That does. Yeah. It's funny. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Only a couple more articles left. Let's move over to Markets Insider. Uh, and this is actually a, a – oh, actually, this is our last article. Shoot, I screwed it up. Really? Uh, see, that we normally have Peter yeah, here, and he, he keeps, keeps track us all in this line. Stuff. Uh, so you know why I always like to end the news segment on a crazy and weird article? We have a follow-up to an article that we reported on a couple of weeks ago uh, about the uh, – what was the name of the Bitcoin exchange – uh, it is in here somewhere. Quadriga CX. I was going to say, do we cheat them and how? <laughs> <laughs> so Quadriga CX hit the news a few weeks ago when their CEO went overseas to India and died. And how dare he? Uh, and Happens to the best of us. In his head, he had the only copy of the password to some of the cold storage wallets, resulting in hundreds of millions of dollars, I think it was like $130 million, or something, something like yeah, that, uh, uh, becoming uh, un inaccessible. And Quadriga CX, result, as a result, had to declare bankruptcy. Well, more information has come out. People have been exploring this. The laptop of the CEO has been seized. And the first article, the one that I posted originally, and Daniel had to correct me on this, said that they had broken into the, the laptop. They actually had found a way to compromise it, get into it, and start getting data. Uh, since then, they have released information saying that that has not happened. They've yeah. not actually hacked into it. Uh, but what they did find was by analyzing the blockchain records, it looks like that missing money actually left almost eight months before the CEO's death so that money disappeared, hmm. and the odds are it's not a matter of a password accidentally being lost. Now we have some nefarious situations. So now we just need Robert Stack to come out and be like, where did you go with the money? 
The mm. world may never know. <laughs> it's, and then uh, cue the spooky music. And the <laughs> I guess Ernst & Young, what are they, like a, a forensic accounting firm or something mm. like that? Um, 14 user accounts created under various aliases, yeah. and then money started changing hands. Like Whoopsie ghost accounts. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. yeah. So the way I figure, there, there's a couple of possibilities here. Now, he did die in India, and uh, you know I, I saw one article float a theory, and I thought it was just racist. But then another article <laughs> uh, kind of confirmed that apparently in India, buying a death certificate is not really challenging. So um, I can't wait till the FBI goes to your computer. One. The, <laughs> so the, uh, the 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 body has not been seen. There hasn't been a funeral. There's a lot of weird things around this that suggest maybe the CEO skipped town. And if that's the case, he could have transferred out this over a hundred and whatever million dollars. Actually, one hundred thirty-seven million. Okay, one hundred thirty-seven million. So maybe he transferred it out to his own wallet, skipped town, and that's the end of it. Or maybe he actually did die. In which case, you know, we don't want to speak ill of the dead, but maybe there was a, a breach and the money was lost, and as a result, he you know went and, and offed himself. I don't know. We'll, we'll have to see. But it's uh, a lot hmm. of uh, controversy around yet another Bitcoin. Uh, transaction provider. Uh, this is um, doesn't India use like blockchain technologies for like tracking citizens? Like instead of having so their national ID system. Yeah, mm -hmm. so it's kind of odd that that's where he went, died, and then buying a death certificate because they don't. How does that work in India? I I don't know. I I didn't think it was odd because India is really really big. Yeah. Like they have a huge population. Yeah. So if you're gonna go somewhere like. China's the biggest, India's second, we're the third. So you, you see those kind of things pop up. Or actually, I think Russia's the third, yeah, aren't they? I think Russia might be. Yeah. Anyhow, so when somebody goes to one of those countries, I'm not surprised. Uh, but you know, India is a really diverse country. It has all these different regions. And so it, it's difficult to uh, maintain the same rule of law across all of them. So, I mean, you could say here in the U.S., I. I bet I could buy a, a death certificate in some cities here. Just find uh, the right medical examiner, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Got well, a drinking, drinking problem. Million dollars, a lot of gambling so. debt. <laughs> and, and that was why I said, like, the first article I saw, I thought, ah, it's just racist. You know, because we do a lot of the stuff right here in the yeah, States. Yeah. But, uh, you know, fleeing the country, going somewhere uh, to a country that is uh, supportive of blockchain or, or whatever, that might make it easier for him to funnel funds. Although I figure... He would go to Southeast Asia, you mm. know, uh, places like Thailand and all. It's easier. I, I assume it's easier <laughs> to funnel yeah. funds. Yeah, that's that so, I know so, about those things. That, that's, that's three comments. <laughs> so when I was doing that thing with the dark web, uh, <laughs> let me tell you that you could probably buy a death certificate. Oh, and, I, and in Southeast Asia, I mean, I assume in Southeast Asia. <laughs> this is I all hearsay yeah, yeah. and speculation. Uh, let the record show that Justin was not involved with uh, bundling of blockchain funds. <laughs> but there's always the future. Yeah. Yeah, there is. So anyhow, follow up on that one. Need to see. Um, we'll have to, to see where that goes. Uh, interestingly, almost all of the major uh, bit, Bitcoin or, or cryptocurrency exchange compromises Seem to turn out to be inside jobs. You know, Mount Mount Grox was like this, mm -hmm. where or Mount Gox, Mount Mount Gox, Gox yeah, uh, where um, you know initially they said, oh, it was a breach, it was a hack or whatever, and then you start to find out, well, actually the CEO was lifting all this money, and now we see the same story repeated here again and again. Uh, and you guys, I think, all know my opinion on Bitcoin at this point. Uh, it's your favorite thing ever. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, if, to poop on. <laughs> it's as safe as storing cash in your back seat in the car. It's really about the same. I gotta uh, go to my. Uh, car. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> You're not supposed to do that. Yeah. But uh -oh. the windows are tinted. Uh -oh. yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the doors I think are locked. I keep it safe by putting gasoline around. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So there are going to be people showing up at this building. <laughs> <laughs> All right, gentlemen. Well, that is. Literally the last news article that I have pulled up here for us this week. So it's been a pretty fun one. Uh, but I want to encourage all of you to stay tuned. So we're going to take a little break here. And when we get back, we're going to be interviewing Michael Sachse, CEO of Stardog, where uh, we'll learn a little bit about their uh, graph system for uh, cyph cyph yeah, siphoning through large amounts of enterprise data, uh, which might sound boring. It's actually pretty fun. So definitely tune in for that. Uh, we will be back in just a few minutes. I'm James Packer. I'm the General Manager of Kirk ISS based in the Cayman Islands. I used IT Pro TV extensively in my last place. It grew very well, helped upskill the team. 
I had 110 engineers in the field and we had dozens of IT Pro accounts with the guys training and last year alone they passed over 40 certs by using the online training. I think I can safely say um, without IT Pro TV I wouldn't be where I was today because I only got this job on the back of the qualifications I have. Welcome back to Technado, everybody. We are here, as promised, with Michael Saxe, CEO of Stardog. We're going to learn a little bit more about their company, what they're doing. We'll learn a little bit more about Michael as well. Uh, and, you know, before I, I launch into some kind of diatribe here, why don't I turn it over to you, Michael? Can you introduce yourself to our viewers and, and just tell us a little bit about, what, you know, just what Stardog is? Sure, happy to, and thanks for having me on. Um, so my name is Michael Saxe. I'm the CEO of Stardog. Uh, Stardog is a data unification company, and that could mean a lot of things. Uh, in our case, what that means is we use a graph database as essentially a chassis to connect data of different schemas and uh, different structures. So, you know, it could be structured, semi-structured, unstructured. Uh, we're able to either materialize the data or virtualize it, and the idea is that, you know, we treat the data where it is and make it so that you can get answers from it. All right. Now, I, I wish there was some way I could give you a virtual trophy because you're probably the first CEO I've talked to this year who didn't use AI or machine learning in the description of their product. Uh, <laughs> so, but, but we are talking well, if, about... Oh. If you ask the right questions, I'll get there. <laughs> <laughs> but we are talking about large amounts of data, which, which companies do certainly have. And uh, I know that you know most of the time in an ideal world, when we have a, a huge data collection. It's easy to get in there and get information. But what you're talking about is a little bit different because we're, we're not saying there's necessarily one system that we can't get at. It's that we have more than one system. Yeah. So you know, what we've seen is that large enterprises and you know think of like the global 2000 here, they've got data They've got business units all over the place. Each of those business units may have different data sets. Uh, you know, they may have some legacy applications that you know they can't put into a data warehouse. They have semi-structured data, unstructured data, and there no one's figured out a way to make it all work together. And you know, our insight has been, you know, let's not try to just get it all in one place. Let's let the data reside where it is, but let's create a way so that you know, uh, um, database architects can pull the data from where it lies without having to move it and copy it. This is one of those things is like, I have a question about that, I guess. Uh, so mm -hmm. we, we have this graph database that's keeping track of all of these things that's exposed as an API to someone or is it a set of tools or how do you actually access that data? Yeah, so, um, you know, our users, uh, download it at some point, obviously they'd buy a license from us, uh, and then they uh, connect it to the underlying sources via API, uh, and then we're able to fit into uh, a front-end application. Uh, we have an integrated developer environment, but most of our clients will you know, put it into some sort of front-end application um, you know, of their choosing. So it could be Tableau, could be something homegrown, anything like that. So what about, you know, when I think about this, when, when I was working more in the data space, we, we had a real big problem with we needed to run some kind of computation, take some kind of metric. Uh, it was really easy to send the computation to the data, assuming that we had an algorithm that, that worked like, like a median doesn't work like that because I can't get the, the median of medians is not a median, but a median of a mean is. Uh, yeah, those of you listen to the podcast, you're like, what? Yeah, stop uh, with your math. Yeah, <laughs> math, math. But is this something where, like, are, are you facilitating that or is it just about, like, querying the data or do you have, like, a computation layer here? It's really about querying the data. So, you know, we're, our, you know, our goal is to be able to get at any type of, so the way we think about it, we want to be able to access all the data uh, or really allow our customers to access all the data. And so we enable that type of querying. And then, you know, if a customer wants to put some type of computation uh, into the queries, you know, that's something we would enable as well. So now, you know, when I first learned about Stardog, I, I saw where, you know, you, you take data from multiple locations, you allow people to query against it. In my mind, I thought, Oh, well, that's easy, right? You just create a copy of all the data. You can change the structure however you want. But you just said a moment ago that we don't have to copy it. So mm -hmm. you're able to reach into these different data sources that potentially have different schemas, different structures altogether, uh, and pull that data out. So 
it, obviously there, there's so many different types of ways that data can be stored. Do you guys have like a, a list of here's the here's the data sources that we support, or are you constantly having to develop new uh, interfaces? Yeah, so it's it's a really good question. So on the first part, um, you know, we use a logical model. And so, so part of, because you're absolutely right, you know, you could copy it and get it there, um, but then what happens when the data changes or what happens when you need to add a new source? Um, and that's where using a logical model gives you reusability. And then uh, we do, uh, you know, have to create different integrations to different sources, but what we find is that, you know, it's a classic 80-20 problem. Uh, and that, you know, most enterprises are using, you know, they're using Oracle, they're using SAP HANA, they're using Mongo, you know, they've got, you know, there's some limited list. And then, you know, we add to that as uh, the need arises. This is, um, so, okay, we're not copying data. Mm -hmm. We can query it. Yep. We're interfacing with all these, but do I have to learn like the start all query language or how does that work? That's a great question. So, you, so we use a query language called Sparkle, which is uh, the W3C standard for graph querying. But we know that not everybody knows Sparkle. Uh, and so you know, one of the things we've done is uh, we've also um, built a translator from GraphQL, uh, which more people know. Uh, so if, you, if GraphQL is something you're familiar with, we can translate that into Sparkle for you and then run the queries that way. Uh, I, I would be remiss if I didn't point out that Sparkle, we like to say Sparkle is just a sequel with curly brackets. <laughs> uh, I don't know, curly brackets make me nervous. Uh, that's one of those things where I'm like, wait a minute, do I have all the ones that I need? Ah, it's broke. Uh, but, but it is good to hear that, you know, you're providing a, a commonly used interface on top of Sparkle if you're not familiar with that. Um, with that, you know, you're adding these new adapters. Are there any any types of data where you go, we can absolutely not handle that? Or is this, if I came to you and I said, I have a billion dollar company, but it just mm -hmm. so happens that we have this data that's in this weird file format layer that has this kind of a query engine on it. Is that something that Stardog could accommodate? Uh, obviously within reason. Um, mm -hmm. Or is this... We're, we're really focused on, again, like you said, like the 80-20, like Oracle or MySQL or Mongo. Yeah, so we haven't seen that come up just yet. Like, you know, we've, we've been able, you know, every now and then we get a request and we get nervous about it. And then, you know, we look, we look and see how hard it would be, be to, you know, to, to connect to that type of data source. We haven't had a problem to date. Where we see more complication is around what I would, describe as unrealistic expectations <laughs> for uh, unstructured data in particular. So it's like, you know, we use Stanford NLP uh, to, to ETL unstructured data, but, um, you know, I think sometimes people think we have some like, you know, magic button on that. And it's like, no, 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 we have the same tools as everyone else. Like, you know, if you have some amazing algorithm that's going to help us understand your NLP, we're happy to work with it. Or sorry, uh, understand your unstructured data, we're happy to work with it. Um, but that tends to be the area we get the most confusion. Uh, yeah, I uh, as have done some of that myself. Uh, unrealistic expectations leads to some some horrible conversations. They're like, what? You you just can't look at these multidimensional arrays that we don't actually have any way to look into? <laughs> uh, no, we, no, we can't. Um, they're... Uh, so this Sparkle, right? And we have mm -hmm. GraphQL and we can interface with most of these is what are, what is probably the, the most victorious you've been? You're like, wow, I didn't, I was kind of nervous about that, but we came through and it actually works flawlessly. What, what's a good mm -hmm. use case there? Yeah. So the ones, I mean, there are lots of them. Uh, you know, I don't want to, I mean, I'll give you some examples without naming the customers, but uh, there's some digital map products um, that uh, you know, we help out with in a way we're proud of. Um, you know, we also have some large enterprises. I'll, I'll give a cool example. Um, you know, a large enterprise has uh, 100,000 employees. And if you think about a complicated employee base or a large employee base, you have an HRIS system, but it doesn't tell you what your employees actually know. 
and they're trying to figure out, you know, who do we have who's an expert in a particular topic? And for them, that's all in their unstructured data, you know, resumes, academic articles, you know, various outputs of jobs. Um, so they use us to look at the HRIS and the unstructured data they have on their employees as one so that they can find someone who's an expert, let's say, in thermodynamics within 50 miles of Gainesville. Um, and, uh, you know, things like that are pretty cool when you see it come together. So let me let me switch kind of the, the angle of our questions here. Uh, now now it sounds like a, a interrogation. <laughs> so, uh, can so, you pull that light closer to your face so we can really get the fit? I'm joking. I'm joking. So um, you know when we're talking about a company's data, it, it mm-hmm. that typically is a company's lifeblood. Their data is really yeah. important. And when we talk about any third party system that taps into that data, even a little bit of it, but in this case we're talking about all of it. I always get a little bit nervous, right? We've got security, we have regulatory compliance, we have a lot of things that are in the mix there. So, um, you know, what are some of the steps that that you guys provide to make sure that that data stays safe? You know, if my data is having to transmit out to your servers, it's obviously at risk. So how do you guys overcome that? Yeah, no, great question, Don. And, you know, in a prior life, I worked uh, for a software as a service company in the utility space. And so, you know, that was something we saw every day where, you know, utilities had a lot of regulatory issues to focus on. They were very nervous about, you know, releasing their data. Um, And so one of the things that, you know, I really think is counterintuitive about our approach is we're really focused on delivering in a hybrid environment. So, you know, customers can download our software, put it behind their firewall, put it in AWS if they want to, uh, but, you know, they're in control of it and, uh, you know, with large, we, we refer to them as, uh, you know, the nervous industries. Um, you know, we found a lot of good uptake there because they, you know, privacy concerns are real and valid and they're not going to go away. And so we're trying to meet, you know, meet folks where they are on that. Man, this interview is not going the way that I expected because we already, we've already failed on machine learning and artificial intelligence. And now we don't have fully managed cloud software as a service. Uh, those are those are kind of our interview buzzwords, and they're all falling apart here. Uh, uh, I, I'm just stumped. I, I'm just going to sit here. No, I, actually, along those same line, you know, you were talking about ETL, and people had unrealistic expectations. And so, this product is is in a hybrid solution. How much hands on is Startup? I, I just want to get a good idea of like what is my responsibility if I'm using Startup versus you know what are y'all going to take care of? Yeah. So, you know, so. You could start today, uh, and and we have a lot of customers who just download and get going. Um, it, what you really need is you need to have a data model, and then you need to be able to map the sources that you're pulling from. Uh, those are things every now and then will help out, but uh, you know more by way of like you know teaching our customers to learn to fish for themselves. Um, but you know th- it's a fairly low code product. So you said they can download and get started. Is is Stardog is it available for free, and then you provide consulting services on top to support it, or is there a how does the licensing work? Yeah, so I mean, we do an annual license uh, for a product that's in production, um, but you know, uh, we have a developer license, sixty days free. Uh, you know, we want people to try it out. We just are starting to create a hosted sandbox. You know, we think that Graph is going to be a big part of uh, how people manage enterprise data going forward. And so we want to give people tools to learn. Uh, well, it's funny that you say that you think graph's going to be a big part because that, that kind of brought up my other question. You, mm-hmm. you want to make it accessible to people, but uh, I've dabbled in graph databases a little bit. Mm-hmm. Don, have you have you messed with graph no, databases? Not much at all. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So what was the, the impetus for choosing this as kind of the, the chassis, as you said, yeah. for managing all of this? Like what... What does this provide to me versus something else? Yeah, so it, so you know, I got to give credit here to Kendall and Everett and Mike, our founders. Um, you know, they were working initially on well, how do we get artificial intelligence to recognize different schemas that refer to the data? Oh, sorry. Yep. <laughs> we <got it. laughs> now we're back on the there. Right we now. go. Right. I found the question, Don. I found the question. Uh, uh, Using artificial intelligence to, to um, relate different schemas to each other when they contain the same data. And they were doing that through relational data sets. And if you think about it, 
data doesn't exist in a state of nature at the intersection of a column and a row. It's an artificial construct that we've gotten really good with. Um, and so the question they asked was like, well, wait, if we let go of relational as a, you know, as a construct, we lose some things because, you know, relational databases are, you know, hardened and performant and, f and fast. Um, but what we gain is the ability to be more flexible in how data is connected to other data sources. And since that's what we're after, we think it could be really valuable here. So is the, the impetus for this to also, uh, you know, maybe help enterprises see connections between the their, their disparate data sources or what look like disparate data sources? And then you go, well, actually, we found now that the people who are good at thermodynamics are also X, Y, or Z, right? Absolutely. So, you know, just another quick example, like, you know, a customer is using us in their supply chain where, you know, they make a thousand widgets, a hundred widgets go into a box in a warehouse. One of those widgets becomes a component part in the machine. That machine goes out in the field. Each step in that process, it's existing as a different data source or data object. And then it's really hard to trace it backwards and forwards. And so they're using us to do that so they can see, okay, well, where did all those, where did all those widgets end up? And then if one of the widgets fails, where did it come from? That's uh, that's, that's one of those things that seems like it should be a simple problem, but uh, being, you know, in retail, they're like, Hey, where did this come from? I don't know. I did that for a little while. You just go, I don't know. Uh, it showed up and we sold it and uh, we hoped it went well. Right. Uh, so uh, fingers crossed it went out the door. I'm good to go. Um, so that's, that, that's an interesting take. This is, you, you know, Don, I, Actually, I just lost what I was going to ask you. I got I got really excited about being able to well, track all these relationships, and I was like, "Oh, well, there it is. It's well, good." Let, let's do this. We are uh, we're in in March of 2019, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and if you're just tuning in, we are interviewing Michael Saxe, CEO of Stardog, and uh, you know we're through the first quarter of the year. What do you guys have coming down the line that's new and exciting in 2019? What, what what's your objective for this year? Yeah. So, uh, great question. Um, you know, what we're really focused on is making our tools more available uh, to folks who are interested in trying them out and easier to get started with. Uh, and so, so for that, for us, that means you know we're creating a hosted developer environment. So if for whatever reason you know it's difficult to provision a machine or difficult to download onto your computer, you can get started and try and uh, you know just you know uh, do it via AWS. Uh, second, um, we're building out what we call Stardog University, which is really just intended to be, you know, general graph learning tools uh, so that, you know, uh, we have a lot of great graph experts. And, uh, you know, if that's something folks are interested in, we want to make that really easy. And then the third, I'm worried I'm going to hit a buzzword here, but uh, <laughs> but uh yeah, we are moving um, to a Kubernetes uh, system. And so on the back end, that's something we're doing a lot of work on right now. Awesome. Well, you know, uh, it, it may be a buzzword, but it's super important. I think there's so many deployments that are moving to that Kubernetes model that if you're not if you're not there soon, then you're going to regret it later. That's for sure. So, all right. Well, it definitely sounds uh, amazing. Uh, I know you, you know you mentioned I was looking up while you were talking about how easy you can get started. Uh, you guys have the Stardog sandbox where you can go to the website. Uh, it is just www.stardog.com/sandbox uh, if you want to go straight to it yep. uh, and spin up an environment quickly and easily. If you've ever tried to stand up like an Elk stack or something, it's a pain in the butt. Here, you're just clicking a few buttons and you're in business, so you can learn really, really quick. So that's a cool feature. Definitely something neat to have. Uh, before we wind things down, is there anything else that you wanted to highlight about Stardog or yourself? Any initiatives going on? Uh, you know, we're really the things I mentioned before, you know, we're eager to help people learn, eager to give people a way to get started and try. Uh, so, you know, I'd encourage listeners or viewers to, to give it a shot. And if you have questions, uh, we also love to answer questions and help people figure out where they're getting stuck. So don't be shy. And what, where's the best place for them to go? Do you guys do that via Twitter, a blog, a forum? What, what do you have? Yeah, so we have a community forum uh, that supports questions and then also uh, you know, Slack support uh, for folks who are interested in getting a little more serious. 
Excellent. Well, Michael, I really appreciate you spending the time with us. I know our viewers do too. It's always fun to hear about new products that are out there and especially ones that you can try. I mean, super risk-free. That's always nice. You don't have to commit your whole team just to try a product. So uh, definitely fun. Thank you for spending the time with us. Thank you guys for the great discussion. Really uh, good stuff. All right. And for you viewers out there, thank you for watching. Stay tuned though, because we'll be back right after this with more Technado. My name is Dana Morrison. I'm the IT director at Grace Christian School in Raleigh, North Carolina. IT directors often hoard so much knowledge that it's hard for their team members to learn. IT Pro TV has given us the ability to level up our technicians to a point where they can decide this is important for me to learn. I would recommend IT Pro TV uh, to any IT team. It's just a great tool uh, for any IT professional. All right, welcome back, everybody. Well, that was a, a fun interview. You know, I, I really I appreciate it when we get to meet CEOs that are, are down to earth. And Michael, you know, he seemed like a great guy. Uh, we did finally catch him with uh, machine learning that had to happen. Yeah, it was inevitable. Yeah. It, 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 that buzzword <laughs> finally came. He's like, we were figuring out AI. And I was like, ah, 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 ah. And I think he caught me caught looking at you going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a, Daniel, you missed out on yeah, it. Yeah, I did. I, I was Apparently. absolutely shocked when he described the product and didn't use a single one of our key buzzwords. <laughs> so, did you try to bait him into it? <laughs> yeah, kind of. Yeah. Like, and, but he, you know, finally it did come up. But uh, no, it sounded great. Uh, J Justin, what was your impression? So th this this product, you know, what they're he described it as a data unification, and I like that description because you know, in some prior jobs and life kind of thing, all these disparate data systems, getting a unified, like a, either a query system or some kind of interface, it was like a pipe dream. You're like, oh, I got this over here, and this is in a Mongo database, and what is this? Oh, that's a legacy, like, columnar store. I, I just want to see. And the fact that they're really focusing on helping corporations say, hey, well, that stuff you have in Mongo and that you have in the Oracle database and this that you have in your human resources systems, these are related by these relationships. And, you know, he, he talked about that was the, the impetus for choosing a graph structure. So I'm, I'm pretty interested to see how this, this grows up over the next year, two years. Yeah, it should be really cool. It's uh, certainly a neat product and you can try it in the sandbox with absolutely zero efforts. Definitely take a look at it. We've had some really good big data interviews in the last year. Uh, you know, Gravwell was another one, and, and there have been several that just are uh, really neat products. So good to see that space growing. All right. Well, you know, before we wind down, I do want to remind everybody that the TechNATO podcast is brought to you by the people at IT Pro TV. We create content here for the podcast, which is our fun stuff. We also create content for them, which much of it is available absolutely free of charge, like the IT Pro TV webinar series. Be sure to check out and go to itpro.tv slash webinars. I've got the page pulled up right here and you can see some of the things we've got going on. Uh, we have the Undead of IT supporting legacy systems, a podcast coming up on March 14th. And then we've got Landing Your Dream IT Job using LinkedIn with Mr. Wes Bryan coming up on March 28th. Both webinars absolutely free. Please jump over there, sign up for them, and you can watch them. And also on that same page, you can scroll down and see all of our historical webinars. In this episode, we referenced the Dark Web webinar more than once. So somewhere down in here, you'll find uh, we did a two-part series, yep, right? Yeah, Exploring is. the Dark Web and Exploring the Dark Web Part 2. So you can watch those if you want. Uh, again, totally free of charge. So certainly do that. Uh, Speaking of not totally free of charge, if you would like to learn more about any of the technologies we've talked about, the IT Pro TV course library is packed full of educational content from Microsoft, Cisco, uh, Amazon, <laughs> you name it, Google, whatever. Uh, I'm having a hard time thinking of vendor names. Uh, but anyhow, jump in there. You can learn stuff. If you want to sign up, be sure to go to go.itpro.tv slash technado because there's a 30% off discount code right there. Uh, so when you go to purchase, you'll save 30%, not just from your first month, but from the entire life of your subscription. So definitely a great deal. Check that out. And that applies to personal and business accounts. So if you want to buy for your team, the product, uh, the, the promo code is TECHNATO30. If you just want to type it in instead of going to the website, all that is available right there. All right. Well, Daniel, Justin, thank you guys for jumping in and covering for Peter. I think you did a... <laughs> Uh, mediocre. mediocre, mediocre job. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's probably we were shooting I shoot for, for. mediocre. Yeah. 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 I'm gonna be honest with you. 
I'm kind of surprised you allowed both of us in the same room on camera. This I, was this was a real crapshoot yeah, for you, yeah. Don. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, uh, we so, all have lapses in decision making. Yeah, hey, life sometimes deals you a hand of cards, and you got to play with it. This week, I bluffed, and uh, <laughs> nobody called my bluff. Yeah, no, and so here we are. Yeah, uh, yeah but it, it was it was pretty good fun, and and you know, I I just like new technology, so it was it was good to sit in on the interview. Awesome, cool stuff. All right, gentlemen, well, thank you. And for you, the viewer out there, thank you especially. Uh, be sure to tune back in next week for more Technado. You know, we do this thing every single week. You can find us on uh, various podcast platforms inside of the iTunes podcast library as well, or you can find us on our own website if you go to technado.tv. Wait, technado.com? <laughs> Wherever I said, Technado See, something. I wanted to buy techne.do, and they told me that was silly, so now I can't remember the URL. But uh, be sure to check it out. You can uh, like us, follow us on Facebook, click our social media links. I do a terrible job of this. Peter is way better. Uh, use a Facebooky this is a thing. Dumpster fire right here. <laughs> uh, we have some social media crap. Check it out. <laughs> and be sure to tune back in next week. We'll see you then. Thanks for watching, Technado.